Their idea of a liberal education, the studia humanitatis, as they called it, continued to include grammar and rhetoric from the old curriculum, but it added a strong dose of a canon of classical authors who wrote poetry, history, and treatises on politics and political and, and on philosophy. They thought these studies themselves were delightful, but also they were essential for achieving the goals of a liberal education, which were to become wise and to speak eloquently. The emphasis was on use and action. <clears throat> the beneficiary of a humanistic liberal education was meant to know what is good so that he could practice virtue. Castiglione, uh, in his book of the courtier, set forth the ideal of the well-rounded man <clears throat> who united in his person <clears throat> a knowledge of language, literature, and history with athletic, military, and musical skills, all framed by good manners and good moral character. <clears throat> These qualities were thought to be desirable in themselves, but they would also be most useful to a man seeking his way in the world of uh, Renaissance Italy. <clears throat> the civic humanists looked to the liberal education of the humanists to train good men for public service, for leadership in the cultural and political life of their city. Such humanists as uh, uh, Coluccio Salutati, Leonardo Bruni, Poggio Bracciolini, each of them served as chancellors of their city, Florence, and they used their skills and abilities to defend it against aggression uh, of different kinds. They also found time to write histories of their city, which was, were meant to celebrate its virtues and to win for it the devotion of its citizens, which they thought a no less important contribution to its uh, survival and to its flourishing. <clears throat> One of these uh, uh, Florentine humanists, uh, Pietro Paolo Vergerio, summarized the humanists' ideas neatly as follows. <clears throat> We call those studies liberal, <clears throat> which are worthy of a free man. Those studies by which we attain and practice virtue and wisdom. That education which calls forth, trains, and develops those highest gifts of body and mind, which ennoble men and which are rightly judged to rank next in dignity to virtue only. For to a vulgar temper, Gain and pleasure are the one aim of existence. To a lofty nature, moral worth and fame. For the Italian humanists, freedom meant to put aside concern for gain and to devote oneself to the training of mind, body, and spirit for the sake of higher things. <clears throat> No more than the ancients did the humanists think that liberal education should be uh, remote from the responsibilities and rewards of the secular life of mankind. Their study should lead to a knowledge of virtue, but that knowledge should also lead to virtuous action in the public interest, moreover. And such actions should bring fame as their reward. Now, the idea of a liberal education came to America by way of the English colleges and universities, where the approach of the Renaissance humanists gained favor only in the 18th century. <clears throat> in the 17th century, the study of a broad range of classical texts on a variety of subjects had no institutional home in England. <clears throat> but in Georgian England, the humanist education took hold. But the English version of a humanistic liberal education showed very little interest in the hard training that turned philology into a keen and powerful tool for the critical examination of primary sources and the discovery of truth. 
nor was it meant as preparation for an active life of public service. It was an education, really, of one of Castiglione's courtiers rather than one of the civic humanist's chancellors. <clears throat> the result was an education that suited English society in the 18th century, one where the landed aristocracy was still powerful and where connections and favor were important. A liberal education was one suitable to a free man who, it was assumed, was well-born and rich enough to afford it. It was to be a training aimed at gaining command of arts that were liberal. And then I quote as a contemporary dictionary, such uh, arts that were liberal, such as fit for gentlemen and scholars, and not for those who were servile, that is to say, mechanic trades and handicrafts suited for meaner people. It was not an education meant to prepare its recipients for a career or some specific function, but it was an education for gentlemen. The goal was to produce a well-rounded man <clears throat> who would feel comfortable and who accepted the best uh, could be, would be I'm sorry, accepted in the best circle of society, and so to get on in the world. It placed specific emphasis, special emphasis, on preparing young men to make the kind of educated conversation that was required in polite society. There was no fixed canon of authors on which one was examined at school or university. Their main contribution to the current idea of liberal education was to give their students the opportunity to make the right sort of friends. <clears throat> and friendship, as one schoolmaster put it, is known to heighten our joys and to soften our cares. But no less important, he said, by the attachments which it forms, is often the means of advancing a man's fortune in the world. Such an education prized sociability above the solitude of hard study. It took a dim view of solitary study aimed at acquiring knowledge for its own sake, which was called pedantry, a terrible term of abuse at the time. <laughs> Pedants were thought to be fussy, self-absorbed, engaged in the study of knowledge that was useless. Sort of like professors today. <laughs> we find fathers writing to warn their sons at the university against the dangers of working too hard and becoming pedants, ruining their health and damaging their social life. Education was meant to shape character and manners much more than intellect. <clears throat> In the first decade of the 19th century, the numbers of undergraduates <clears throat> entering the universities grew rapidly. <clears throat> Though the new generation came from the same social class as its predecessors, its members thought and acted differently, for the world had changed. The long years of war against France, the arrival of the radical ideas of the French Revolution, the vogue of romantic individualism, and the revival of serious interest in religion that came uh, uh, in their wake unsettled the easygoing society of 18th century England and its emphasis on polite behavior. The pressures of war made the government take at least a few steps towards filling important posts on the basis of, would you believe, competence instead of connections. <clears throat> the response of the university faculties was to revive a medieval device that had fallen into disuse, competitive examinations. <clears throat> These examinations had the desired effect. Absorbing the time and energy of the undergraduates and turning their minds away from dangerous channels. They also 
enhanced respect for the universities and the teachers in them. The idleness of the 18th century, and all you have to do to understand that is to get hold of Gibbon's autobiography in which he describes his years at Oxford to get some grip on the idleness that was characteristic of the 18th century university. Uh, <clears throat> for most students, a liberal education came to mean now, in the 19th century, the careful study of a limited list of Latin and Greek classics with emphasis on mastery of the ancient languages, but it was now justified on a new basis. This kind of learning, it was said, cultivated and strengthened the intellectual faculties. Commissions investigating Oxford and Cambridge in the 1850s concluded that it is the sole business of the university to train the powers of the mind. The new definition, the uh, defined curriculum, and the examination system that connected them greatly improved both the performance and the self-confidence of university faculties. Before long, however, <clears throat> they came under attack from two directions. The growth of industry and democracy led to a demand for a more practical education that would be useful in ways that the Oxbridge liberal education was not. It would train the students for particular vocations on the one hand, <clears throat> and it would provide the expertise, the new kind of leaders needed in the modern world on the other. <clears throat> At the same time, critics in the mid-19th century complained of the loss of old values of liberal education, undermined by these limited classical curriculum, the sentence parsing, fact cramming imposed by the examinations. <clears throat> Liberal education, they insisted, must not be narrow, pedantic, one-sided, in short, illiberal. It must be more than merely useful in a pragmatic sense. It must train the character and the whole man, not merely the mind but the restless, tumultuous industrial society of the 19th century, increasingly lacking agreement and a common uh, core of values, needed leaders who were trained in more than style and manners. Such leaders must understand the magnitude of the new problems. Liberal education must become general education, including languages, literature, history, and the natural sciences. <clears throat> the words of one writer, <clears throat> a man of the highest education ought to know something of everything and everything of something. My teachers were still telling me that when I was a freshman in college. <clears throat> now the answer of some was universal knowledge. These people urged a broadening of the field of learning <clears throat> to include all that was known and an attempt to, uh, to synthesize and integrate the information collected by discovering the philosophical principles that underlay it all. As one Victorian writer put it, the summit of a liberal education is philosophy, meaning by philosophy the sustained effort to frame a complete and reasoned synthesis of the facts of the universe. 